So we are super excited to be hosting Bean Kim today to give a talk entitled Interpretability for Everyone. Bean is a staff research scientist at Google Brain. Her research focuses on improving interpretability in machine learning by building interpretability methods for all models or building interpreted, inherently interpretable models. She spoke at the G20 meeting in Argentina in 2019 her work TCAB has received the UNESCO Net Expo Award, was featured at Google I.O. 2019, and in Brian Christian's book on the alignment problem. Bean gave a keynote speech at ECML 2020, and has given tutorials on interpretability at ICML, the University of Toronto, CVPR, and the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. She was co-workshop chair at iClear 2019, and has been area chair at conferences including NeurIPS, ICML, iClear, and AI Studies. She received her PhD from MIT. Bean, welcome to Open. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Really excited to speak at Oatmeal. It's such a great name. Uh, so let me full screen. Uh, yeah, as uh, Andrew said, interrupt any time with questions. I can't really see the questions, so Andrew is going to help me out to if there's a question, somebody raise your hands and he's going to let me know. All right, so I'm going to talk about work with a lot of awesome people inside and outside of Google on interpretability for everyone. Last couple of years has been amazing for the field of interpretability. Uh, there has been a lot more papers, there have been workshops, but most importantly, folks has realized the importance of this topic, which wasn't really the case when I started working on this topic. But I still see this as a drop in the ocean. Unlike supervised problems like classification, where there is a concrete mathematical metric like accuracy uh, that exists while it's not perfect, that exists that, that you can check your concrete progress on the way, interpretability, you don't really have that mathematical definition. Why? Well, psychologists who's been trying to do that for centuries can give you a better answer, but simply put, you can't really define and express humans in math. So we have this goal somewhere out there that says help users, whether that's helping doctors to diagnose patients better and then use the model more safely or unbiased model. We don't really have a way to measure that every step on the way. But it's incredibly important as we go that we, we check that we are going into the right direction and we sail this boat in the right direction. And more importantly, as a community, we're sailing in the same direction together so that we can go somewhere. Uh, without that, we might be circling in one place forever. So this talk, I'm going to talk about one way to uh, ensure that we are making progress. Uh, that is, first, we're going to stop this boat and think about where we're going uh, by taking a critical look at existing methods and see, oops, investigate the tools that we have in our disposal. And then we're going, I'm going to introduce a family of methods that are designed to be user and human centric. Uh, and these methods kind of came one after another whenever we stopped and asked ourselves how we can do better. So first, where are we going? Let's focus our discussion on post-training interpretability methods. Uh, and what's that? Well, it just means that you have a model and you can't really change the model. Somebody gave you the model uh, that, and, and you just have to interpret that. That's the, the question in, in, of interest. And let's say you have a neural network that takes a picture and predicts what's in the picture. So to put that simply, the goal of post-training interpretability method is given this model, find the, the evidence of prediction. In other words, why was this a jungle bird? Now, one of the most popular interpretability methods for images is called saliency maps. Uh, this is using a, a, a family of methods that builds something on top of a simple derivative, uh, where derivative is the probability of the prediction with respect to every single pixel. Now, it, intuitively speaking, this is just you take one pixel and change it by a little bit. And if the probability of the bird 
changes a lot, that means it's important pixel and therefore put a bigger weight. Do that for all the pixels and you get map or image look like this. So that makes sense. And based on that elegance uh, of the, the, the bare bones structure of this method, there has been explosion of methods using this kind of approach, uh, including some of my work in 18, lots of popular methods here. You know, as it, you look at it, some methods looks at maybe the boundary of the birds more, uh, some methods, this my work looks like it's gonna it, it's looking at the tail more and so on you know it, but in general it highlights the bird and the picture and it kind of makes sense but now let's uh take a step back and uh ask us this question so the promise of these methods is that these pixels are the evidence of prediction so it's a function of prediction so then when prediction changes, the explanation will probably change because it's showing something about the prediction. But and, and when the prediction is random in extreme case, then that's the case the explanation should really change, because if it doesn't, then you're at odds with your claims that this is evidence of prediction. So we tested that uh, we took a perfectly good looking neural network that is superhuman performance and whatnot, and got saliency map for many, many images, not just the birds, many, many classes. And then we took the same image and we started randomizing the weights from the top layer, all in the cascading manner for all the way to the bottom layer. So as soon as you randomize any weights, your prediction, your model is garbage. It, it predicts randomly. So you would think that the saliency map should also change but it doesn't. Uh, some might argue that, well, these two maps technically look slightly different because, you know, it's not identical map. But remember, the, the whole goal of saliency map or interpretive method in that matter is for human consumption. And as a human, I can't tell. Uh, I don't think I will draw a different conclusion based on these two things. The belly of the bird looks important and maybe the cheek of the bird looks important in both pictures. And in fact, uh, the pictures that I just showed you in a couple of slides ago, half of these are generated from random network. Now I'll give you a second to see if you can tell which ones are from random network. And feel free to say it on the chat, which I can't see, but Andrew will help me uh, if, if anyone gets it right. I'll be very impressed. So I don't know if anybody answered it, but the answer so we have is C and D, D, sorry. C and D, okay. So D is correct, there's two more. Well, I think we have A being somewhat frequent, uh, A, B, E. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're getting almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, and that proves my point. So the answer is, and you, of course you can't tell, uh, answer is B, D, and F, or, generated from completely random network. Now we did this for many images and for many, many uh, popular methods. Each row is a method, each column is uh, a different, uh, the, the layer randomized. So all the, in a cascading manner, so the, the last column, you're looking at completely random network. And as you can see, a lot of methods, they don't even change, even, even slightly as we randomize the network. So, so shocked by this result, we, we now tried something differently crazy, which is instead of randomizing a trained network, let's train a network with random labels. So first column is a, a sane network, which is uh, trained with true labels. Second row is random labels. Now this, the random labels, uh, the network with random labels, it never learned what digit zero means. But for some methods, as you can see, it kind of looks like it might have learned digit zero, which is misleading. So since this work is published uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I've seen reviewers asking uh, methods, new methods, uh, whether they have run this test or not. And I've seen many authors ended up having to run this method. There has been a number of methods that ensures passing this test by construction. Uh, and the folks came up with new sort of better tests, which is all great. But how did we get here? 
there has been many years where a lot of people, including myself, uh, worked on this method, thinking like, yeah, this is this is promising direction. What I think might have happened, one of the factor is the confirmation bias, which is something that I encounter over and over again in my work. What happened, what might have happened is people expected to see a bird in that picture, the, the map, and they saw a bird and they liked it because that's what they expected to see and they confirmed their uh, sus sus uh, suspicion. And this is such a strong effect that I think it's one of the most important thing that we have to pay attention to whenever we're designing interpretability methods. And also remember, this is just a start. This is a pretty low bar test. We really should have been passing this test like many years ago. Uh, what we need is to come up with many different tests, many better tests that that could um, so that we can hold these methods to high standards and they have to pass, pass all these more smarter uh, tests. Some of these methods, however, it are shown in their paper that it mean, meets that final goal, the help users, and they show the um, actual application and use of these methods. So I think there's something in these methods that could help humans. We just don't know what they are. And so we need to study more what they are so that we can get more of it. All right, All right let's move on. So with that in mind, let's think about how we can do better, where I introduce new set of family of methods. So let's again uh, focus, our, uh, fo focus our attention to post-training explanations, where you will again have a model and your goal is to, and you, let's say your model predicts whether this is gonna be popular pizza or not. Your question is, why was this popular pizza? Now let's take that saliency map that we just talked about uh, and use this, to help, use this to help us to think about what we really want to ask to the model. So as I squint at this picture of a popular pizza saliency map, I notice that there's some tomato and maybe the crust is highlighted, but I'm not quite sure which one's more uh, brighter. Uh, you know, it makes sense that tomatoes toppings are important. The, the crispy crust is a heart of the pizza, good pizza, uh, but I don't know which one. I also think that wine uh, might have been a little bit highlighted, which makes sense because great beverage goes a long way with great pizza. Uh, my personal choice would have been beer with pizza, but wine is also fine. Uh, so maybe I, as, a, as a restaurant owner, maybe I should put more attention to making good beverage menu rather than the toppings itself. Is it true for only this picture or all the pizza pictures? Because that's really important for me to make a decision whether to focus on toppings or the beverage. The problem is that you can't really express these concepts as pixels, uh, especially uh, when the uh, especially across many many pizza pictures. If you had these concepts that uh, we just thought about tomato and crust at training time, that you can use saliency map, but you didn't. I just came up with them after I trained the model. It just came to me only then. So wouldn't it be great if we can quantitatively measure these importance of these concepts that you chose after the training? And that's what we did with TCAV, testing with concept activation vectors, where we provide quantitative explanation of concepts like gender or race, whatever you chose, um, that is important uh, and tell you how important they are for the prediction, even if that concept wasn't part of training. So in this case, our question is, which topping was important for this popular pizza in image classifier? Uh, let's, let's switch that a little bit to ask different uh, the zebra question to, to guide, uh, tell you a little bit about how this works. So now the question is, how important was the stripes concept to this zebra image classifier. First and foremost question you might have is, okay, well, concepts, that sounds good, but what is it? How do you even express this in your network? To express concept in your network, we do the simplest possible thing. We learn a vector that represents it and we call it concept activation vector or CAV. To learn CAV, you need a couple of ingredients. First, you need as examples of concepts, in this case, pictures of stripes, and you see some random images. 
then you have the network that you want to investigate and you have access to their activations, the internal tensors. Once you have these, you pipe in these images into the network and you train a linear classifier that separates random image activations from concept image activations. And you have this vector that is orthogonal to the decision boundary, which we call the CAV, and then you're done. Uh, what is this vector? Well, this is just a vector that points from random direction to concept direction in the activation space. And this is not a new, new idea. This has been uh, well studied, widely applied in, in the community, as you, as you most of you know. So cool. So we have this vector at our hands. Uh, what are we going to do? Well, how do we use this to get that quantitative measure or the TCAP score? It's also pretty simple. What we're going to do is take, similar to saliency map, where we change the pixel slightly to get that uh, sensitivity of the prediction, we're going to do the similar thing with this concept vector instead. So what this means is we are or conceptually, what it means is we're going to take this vector and change it ever so slightly and see how much the prediction changes. If the prediction changes a lot, that means it's an important concept. If it doesn't, it's not an important concept. It's very well, uh, it's, it's basically just getting directional derivative. We do this for many, many zebra pictures. And after all, you count the number of zebra pictures that gave you positive uh, directional derivative. And you can change this definition of TCAP score to be have an inequality, or uh, maybe it's just count the signs and whatnot, whatever that fits your bill in your application. So that's cool, but how do you know this cab is legit? Like the high dimensional space, uh, like yeah, funky things happen, weird unintuitive things happen. How do we know this is legit? So let's talk about that. How can we do better? How do we know that this is legit? The goal is quantitatively guarding ourselves against spurious cab. Uh, in other words, how do we know that this was just by luck? There's lots of different ways. So here's a one way to do it. Remember, we trained that CAV against many random sets of set, set of images. Now, because they're random, you can train many, many CAVs using many, many different sets of random images as many times as you want. From those, each of those CAVs, you can get a TCAP score for a target, the zebra. Then you have many, many TCAP scores for one target using one set of concepts. And you can view this TCAP scores as a sample from a particular distribution. And you can compare that distribution with TCAP score with random calves, where random calves are uh, replacing the concept images with random images. And you can do statistical testing between these two distributions and make sure that these two distributions are statistically significantly different. And only then we use those concepts to draw our conclusion. If there's a concept that user wanted to try, but it didn't pass this test, then we simply say, sorry, you, your concept that you had in mind doesn't exist in this model, try again. So we're going to look at some results, uh, some, some subset of results. Uh, we tried these concepts on many different sets of concepts, uh, color, red, yellow, blue, green, uh, race, and, and uh, objects. So for fire engine, uh, we get high red and high green because a lot of fire engines are apparently sitting on a grassy field. Uh, and that makes sense, unless you're from Canberra, Australia. In Canberra, Australia, fire engines are yellow. And there's a really good reason why they should be yellow actually everywhere, because you can see it better at night, which might be important. So it shows that this model might have a geographical bias. And of course, there are other terrible uh, biases that this model is known to have, and, and our quantity, we can now quantitatively confirm those biases. Uh, this model has been applied to language model and many others at Google. Here, for example, Ben Hutchinson's work applied this to online comment classific classifier, toxic or non-toxic, uh, and he tested whether LGBT concept has uh, 
been properly classified after unbiasing the model, confirming that unbiasing technique, particular technique that this team used was working. Uh, we got really excited and we took this to doctors uh, who can diagnose di diabetic retinopathy. Uh, di diabetic retinopathy or DR is treatable but side threatening conditions. There's a model published uh, that can predict this DR score with 85% accuracy. So the natural question is whether the concept that the machine learning model is using is similar or different from diagnostic concepts that human doctors used and trained to use. So to do this, we went to a doctor and we asked her what are the concepts she would normally look for when she suspects DR level four and what are the concepts she doesn't look for. And we get that for many different levels of level four and level one. Now we use TCAP to ask the same question to the model this model that was published, when prediction score is high for DR level four, which is the most severe level of DR, TCAP shows that it is consistent with doctor's knowledge. The green that the green concepts that doctors wanted to see high, they're high. The red ones, they're suspected to, to low, it's low, that's all good. But when models prediction accuracy is mediocre, like level one, this is most mild level of DR, it shows that the model is using concept HMA, which is a type of hemorrhage in your blood vessel uh, that doctors would have not used. Now, digging this further, they realize that the model often confuses level one and level two, and level two happens to have a lot of HMA. Uh, and farther down the road, they, they also discover that the labelers were often confused. There's a gray area between one and two. So there might have been some confusion there that which might have caused the model to have the confusion. So this was revealing that that confusion, uh, TCAP was answering, reflecting that confusion of the model. Before I move on to next, any questions so far? was a question about an earlier part of the talk, which is um, which post hoc method least violates the two sanity checks you mentioned? Is there one that is more reliable than the others? Uh, that's a great question. I always hesitate to answer that question. I get that question a lot. And the reason is that there's a quantitative way to answer that question and qualitative way to answer that question. Qualitatively, when you look at that picture that I showed you in earlier, you actually can't really tell the difference in any of the methods. Let me show you that here, right? If you square at it, and, and remember the first column is the same network and the second column is uh, a Letty random network because we randomized the logits. And if you look at the difference between those two, all of all, all, most of the methods, you can tell. Maybe GradCam, uh, it's it's bright red, but as a human, I don't think I can tell the difference between the two. Um, and even GradCam later on uh, comes back to something that kind of resembles the, the same network response. So qualitatively, I think it's uh, the jury is out there. Uh, for quantitatively, uh, there are some methods that that was that seemed better than others. The GradCam was one of them. Uh, however, I, I really think that there, we need to do a lot more study to figure out what's really going on underneath. There's a follow-up work that we published this year in Europe uh, with, with Julius again, uh, where we ran large-scale human experiments uh, and show people these salience maps where the models have some bugs in them. So for example, the model had random labels or model had some uh, distributional, significant distributional shifts and when we were testing whether humans can tell the difference. Um, and TLDR there is that humans can't really tell the difference using these methods. Um, so yeah, the, the, to answer that question in, in, the, in, in long, long form, I think we have to do a lot more work before we can say definitely about like, yeah, this method works and this method doesn't. That's very interesting. Um, a question from Yan. I'm gonna unmute Yan. I'm gonna assume that he wants to be unmuted but I'm not 100% sure of that assumption, I just happen to know him. Um, and I just remind, if people do want to ask the question in their own voice to please raise also 
raise the hand. And then I'm gonna unmute you. I'm sorry if you don't actually have some questions. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Great. I was wondering how this works. And I just wondered um, like how you, so like in the Cifra image and the Cifra example seemed pretty easy to, um, well, to, to just dig up a couple of pictures of stripes. But it seems like that in the in the retinopathy example, um, you actually need to have like pretty fine grained labels. Um, you first need humans to kind of label every image, saying like kind of which pathological um, concept can be found in this image, right? So um, and so I wonder kind of like how exactly you um, you created the calves for this um, for this retinopathy um, example. Yeah, sure. I think that might be really good segue to my next part, but I, let me answer a little bit. Um, I think you might be on the, the doctor's case. We had, we were fortunate enough to have access to those doctors. And if you're asking whether we like zoomed into particular parts to get that fine grain label, uh, no, we didn't. We just used the same picture uh, with this full scale in to create the caps. Um, for the next part of my talk, I'm going to talk about how you can, you might be able to do this automatically without having to have any human labels. Is it, did I answer my, your, my, your question or? Yeah, yeah, thanks. So basically that you said that it turns out that like by and large, um, um, the model uses the same concepts as, as human doctors, but also you kind of only gave it these concepts um, that you kind of already knew were relevant, right? And if you had some kind of automatic way to discover concepts, like concept discovery, you might end up with very different concepts actually, right? Yes, yes, yes. And that's something that I, I continue to explore and something really interesting. So you're completely right. By giving this concepts that we already know, we're kind of reflecting, we're only testing the ones we know, right? Which is useful, but perhaps less interesting. Uh, Going forward, we're, we, we looked at how to automatically do it and we are continuously working on, can we discover a concept that just simply didn't exist to humans? So I'm working on with scientists, with neuroscientists and also um, like on black hole data to, to see if that's ever possible. There's a really difficult question though even for that. Like if, if, we, if it doesn't exist, if it didn't exist for humans, when we see it, would we know it? Chances are that we may not even know it's new because it's too new. Uh, so a lot of interesting questions there. Yeah, thanks. Very cool. Um, should we take one more and then maybe move on? Sure. Um, so I'm going to, there's a few questions, but we'll get, save them for the rest. Um, I'll, uh, Mike, he has a question. I'm gonna allow you to unmute right now. Hi, Dean. Thanks for the talk. It's really fun. I hadn't heard about TCAF before. Um, it's a really neat method. I think I'd like to understand the counterfactual for the fire engines. So just to kind of check that the concepts it's learning are the concepts we think it's learning in the on the TCAV CAV side. If I were to retrain the model, but remove all the fire engines that weren't from Canberra, does the um, relationship you pointed out switch around so for example it'd be only be yellow green like have you done these kinds of counterfactual sanity checks that i really like mm -hmm. from the first part of the book that's a great idea uh but pretty labor into labor intensive so we have not done that however uh later in the talk we also made this tcap work causal uh, and it, we called it cake um, this that that's work with Amir and Yuri Sharit, who's uh, who's in uh, who's an expert in causal inference. So we tried to there we just build the generated model to test that. Uh, but here in TCAP work particular, we did not test. Oh, you know what? Um, actually, so the the one uh, experiment that we did in the paper, which I uh, I'm very proud of, but it takes too long to explain, so I omitted it here. We actually set up a uh, data set where we know which concept is important because we made up the data set and we can arbitrarily um, change the distribution. There we confirm that the TCAB is doing the expected thing, which is exactly what you said, but in, in this slightly different setting. So yes. Great, thank you. Right, okay, so I'm gonna, let's, let's talk about the next one uh, automatically. Uh, yes, so as, as, 
folks pointed out, what if you don't have concepts? We don't have access to doctors. Can we automate this? And the answer is yes, uh, to some extent for images. Um, this is work with Amirata, who is a uh, PhD student at Stanford. Uh, the setup here, as expected, is you have the train network, but you don't have examples for concepts. Maybe you don't know what concepts to test, or you do have concepts to test, but maybe you don't have examples. So this work is actually uh, one of those papers where uh, simple things kind of worked out together beautifully, and, and we were kind of surprised that this kind of the, the joining of these well-known methods gave us what we wanted. What we did is, first we took training examples and we used super pixel methods on same image multiple times to segment that images. And we gathered this image patches, what we call image patches, and piped that into the network. And we simply clustered, clustered them uh, using some, you know, we did a lot of going back and forth of, you know, in removing the outlier and figure out what works the best. And at the end of the day, you have discovered concepts and the ones that has high or low TCAP scores are the ones that are interesting. Now, the real challenge in this work is to confirm whether these con discover concepts are interpretable. So we did a couple of rigorous human experiments to confirm this. First, we did intruder test, which is among these these six images, for instance, on the left top left corner, tell us which one's weird. And we compared how well human does on that task to hand labeled concepts. These are, we manually crafted this data set and humans do as well on both data set. So that's promising. And then second test, we tested, uh, we uh, did a meaning test, which is on the left, we gave them image patches that we discovered. On the right, we gave them random segments from uh, the same class and asked them, which one do you think it's more meaningful? They did test this task really well, 95% correct. But moreover, we asked them to name this concept. And to my surprise, 56%, more than half of people, put the same name, whether that's face or human. And if you take top two terms of that they put down, 77% people wrote down the same thing, which suggests that these discovered concepts are so consistent, has a theme that humans, many different humans, online targets, uh, would put the same name on. We also tested this quantitatively. Uh, I'm going to go through this quickly. So you add the top most important patches and then you delete most important patches and you see that this is better than random, uh, better than least important and so on. So you, you just confirm that this is just sanity check. To look at some qualitative results, let's look at the dumbbell class on the left bottom corner. The most salient concept uh, turns out to be human skins. Uh, particularly lighter color human skins, which suggests just so many problems in the data set. And depending on what you're trying to do, uh, this may not be your best dumbbell class or, or dumbbell class that you want. So uh, that's great. You can discover uh, that's great. But like, how do you know when to stop? How do you know that how many more images, image patches do you want? How many concepts are enough? So in the next I'm going to talk about how you can discover complete concepts. This is work with Chiquan Ye uh, in 2020 in Europe. Here, the, the goal is to, or, or the key point is to decompose the activations into concept vectors and assume that with by decomposing that activation layer, the vectors that are orthogonal to each other, they each together spend a space where inf all the information are, are contained. That's the basic hypothesis, not a, not a strong one. And to do that, we first use ACE, ACE to segment the images uh, and then optimize, uh, solve the, the, uh, the objective to the, and decompose those concept vectors. And we evaluate those using uh, something we call concept shop. How do we define this metrics, uh, metric for completeness? Uh, it, this, is, this is a complicated equation. It's not that complicated, but it looks complicated. I'm not going to go into detail, 
But why, why this metric? Well, we, under some simple assumptions, this metric is equivalent to top K PCA vectors, which is nice because then we get all those nice theory and guarantees that PCA offers for free. So that's what we did. We uh, compare with ACE and uh, this method, which is the green line uh, and K-means and PCA. And uh, as, as I suspected, often K-means work really well. So K-means are already achieving 90% of completeness, uh, while ACE is increasing amount of completeness. So remember, ACE has no idea of this definition of completeness, but it does the reasonable thing although it might take a while to converge to the end. And here's some examples of Lion. Oh, by the way, this method, uh, so ACE only discovers concepts per class. So it does it for Zebra, does it for Lion separately. Whereas this method, we are trying to discover a concept for entire uh, all the classes. So Zebra and Lion might have overlapping concepts. Oh, before I move on to the next one, any questions? on the parts that I just talked about. A quick question. Um, so what role, okay, actually, no, wait, wait, wait. Uh, so the completeness of the concept, do you find that there's any relationship between that and the task that, that, you're, that you're, like, is that a task dependent thing? I think in ideal world, yes, uh, depending on what you're trying to do, uh, definitely. But for the tasks that we tested in the paper, we just aim for uh, classification and um, minimum number of concepts that, that we want to satisfy. Uh, we also, I think it would be also different for language and other, other shape of data. Uh, we didn't test. Oh, no, we did test it for a simple, like a uh, movie record, the, the simple language model, but for models like BERT or uh, GPT-3 and something much more complex, it would be different. Um, so yeah, a lot more things has to be done there. But to answer your question, it's almost definitely sure, but we think that this completeness definition is a good place to start. Cool. The questions that we have outstanding right now are from a previous section, so maybe... That sounds good. Let's move on and then we can come back to those later. So great. So we talked about so far post-training interpretability methods. You have a model, you can't change the model. But what if you can change the model? What if you have the labels for concepts? For example, zebra, you know the trees are important, 30%, stripes are important. Uh, well, actually, what you know here is that in zebra, you have concept labels, so trees and stripes and lions. Um, what if you build a model from scratch using that concept data? So that's what we do here. This is work with uh, wonderful people from Stanford, uh, this year at ICML. Uh, I just talked about that. So you do that and you have, you only need concept labels at the training time, not the test time, right? Uh, the first thing to check when you build a model from scratch, uh, a lot of people ask, is there a performance trade-off between interpretability and uh, uh, and, perf and the prediction or, or performance. Um, in, my, in my experience and from many others, there is no inherent trade-off. Uh, and we're not talking about simple comparing linear models to neural network. We're talking about putting, building the right structure and iterating over that structure over and over again until you achieve both. So assuming that you are willing to put decent amount of work, uh, I haven't seen the performance difference. Um, so anyway, we checked that. Or is their performance impacted? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, three different ways to train these concept bottleneck models. We did not see uh, much change in uh, error. Uh, why are we doing this? Uh, this is particularly in, in, uh, useful when you want to interact or control the model. So for instance, you don't want the trees and lions to influence the prediction of zebra, which makes sense, then you can kind of zero out that neuron and uh, for that you kind of remove the information of trees and lion uh, that would eventually contribute to the prediction. And you can imagine if you have a medical application, a doctor might say, oh, that symptom is not a cause causal relationship, but uh, or should not contribute to the diagnosis, 
uh, and you can control the model in that way. And so we did exactly that with the medical data set, arthritis data set, where we have the ground truth concept labels, and we take that as if doctors wanted to interrupt with that uh, right concept that they tagged, and doing so showed us that we can improve the model's performance quite a bit. So I'm going to go to next the causal models. Before that, really quickly, if anybody has questions. I don't think there are any questions yet, but uh, all right. All right, let's move on. Uh, so what about causality? Of course, uh, whenever you can, you want to make things uh, properly causal. So that's what we did. This is work with Yash, Amir, and Uri. The basic idea is, again, pretty simple. Um, you know the ATE, average treatment effect. We did the same thing, but except doing the dual operations on concepts. So what does that mean intuitively? Uh, let's say you have a picture and you have a gender prediction uh, classifier. You're calculating the difference expect, expected prediction when the picture has glasses on and when picture doesn't have a glasses on. And of course, how do you get this picture? We train a generative model. We propose two different ways to uh, use this general VAE. One where you only use the decoder. So you sample the Z, the latent dimension, and, and test and generate images in that way with concept on and off so that you can test sort of general distribution. In a second case, you can also use the encoder and decoder so that you can input a particular image in the encoder, get the Z that way, and flip the concept to end the decoder and get the final image. These are just ideas that we had that, that we thought reasonable to try, and we did. Uh, one worked better than others. Uh, to test whether this worked or not, we made up a data set where we uh, put an object, copy and paste an object in the middle of the scenery. So for instance, in the bottom, we pasted like a dog in the middle of a bathroom uh, that, so that we can completely control the, the distribution of concepts for each class. And it turns out that uh, decoder cake, only using the decoder, closely followed the ground truth cake, which was very encouraging. So uh, here's some summary. Uh, we talked about TCAP and friends uh, for CAF testing, discovery, concept completeness, concept bottleneck models, and the causal TCAV. I was thrilled to uh, see responses inside of academia of folks used to for, for medical applications, like here, Carrie Kai used it for doctors to search and uh, sort images, cancer images, using the concept that they're familiar with. Uh, and that showed that this uh, gave some confidence doctors or made this tool more useful, per se. TKF has been uh, applied to radiology, breast cancer, and electric health record data, too. Uh, it's been also applied for storm prediction to say why was this a cat four storm, not cat three, and sort of the concept images, given set of concept images. I was also excited to see uh, responses from outside of academia. After all, the goal of TCAV is to explain machine learning models using users' language and not computers' language. So it was particularly excited that people outside of machine learning were also excited about uh, and find this method useful. Uh, so Sundar talked about this and some of the cases that we uh, we use at Google at Google I/O 19 and uh, UNESCO award was also given to this and uh, other one of the ten um, this was selected as one of ten cutting edge digital innovations with potential of profound and lasting impact. We hope to live up to that uh, that promise. So uh, lastly, but not least, let's talk about how we can do better. The limitations of TCAV. Concepts has to be express, ex expressible using examples. If something you cannot express as example using a set of examples, then this is uh, a remaining question. We, we don't know how to solve this yet. Uh, we don't have names for these concepts. So perhaps we can co-train a language model, something that I think should be possible, uh, and put a name on it, but we don't have the name yet. So in image case, it's nice because we can just scan the, 
discover a concept and kind of get the idea, but in language, it might take more time and that's more fatigue for humans and so on. There's been uh, almost surely a gap between how humans perceive a concept versus how uh, how the network does, um, perhaps from correlation. Uh, for example, in this Karikai's work that I talked about, there's some medical concept that exists only when, like fused glands. Uh, it only exists when there is glands at all to see. So then fused gland, concept of fused gland kind of gets confused with existence of glands, which still help, the, help doctors to sort out the images, but perhaps not exactly what you want. Uh, and making it easy to collect concept examples and developing interactive interfaces, something on my mind. Lastly, things to keep in mind in our journey. Um, this is something that I've talked about uh, over and over again, and I, I think I see some improvement over the last past years. Let's just check where we're going at all times by coming up with tests that we can put our methods through, whether that's sanity check or something slightly smarter test. Um, we made a data set called benchmarking attribution methods where we, for images, where we uh, create this data set that where you can completely control the distribution of how many dogs appear in the bathroom versus how many backpacks appear in the bamboo tree and so on, so that you can verify and validate your method. And here's open source. Uh, and let's always remember humans are biased and irrational. Uh, that's a feature, not a bug. Uh, doesn't mean that we can't trust humans. It just means that whenever we're developing these methods, we have to keep in mind how we might be fooling ourselves. Uh, really good uh, book, uh, if you're looking for a book, uh, it's Undoing Project um, that describes, the book describes a lot of uh, biases, all sorts of things, even folks like you guys who are very computationally minded uh, might fall into lots of uh, number tricks that you just can't deny that you're seeing. It's like an illusion. You cannot see it and make that wrong conclusion. So highly, highly recommend Undoing Project. Uh, thinking about HCI questions is super hard, uh, super important. Uh, I keep emphasizing that we need more designing interaction between humans and machines, how these explanations are exchanged and how humans use them. We need to do a lot more studies to use this right. And let's keep checking that if we're going to the right direction as we go and as a, as a community. With that, i happy to take more questions. Well, first of all, thank you so much for your talk. Very, very interesting, thought-provoking. Um, there's a question from Zora that is uh, quite interesting. Um, it's going back a, few, a little ways, but uh, when you were talking about sort of the new concepts, uh, oh yeah, so how, is, I guess it would be sort of this discovery process, true discovery, which would be something that a human doesn't know about yet. Uh, Zora asks, um, is there a way to do a combination, exploit the concept we have, and explore the new ones you might not know. I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Oh, that's a really interesting idea. I uh, I don't think I thought about that a lot. Hmm. You know what? I think what you can probably do is seed your discovery with concepts you already know. For example, this is probably one of many ideas. Like you can try the ACE method with the existing concepts. And then what you, what you might find is you had this striped concept. You thought it was one striped concept, but maybe you'll real figure learn that, oh, there's a striped t-shirt concept. And then there's a striped nature concept, like zebra, the stripes that occurs in nature. So you might be able to find fine-grained uh, concepts. Um, and I guess you can technically optimize any of these using existing concepts, like for the complete concept work, we optimize and decompose the concept vector, but there you can just assume, okay, well, make sure that you have these concepts that I know, and then what else is left? Uh, so you can just simply plug that in in your optimization. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question, sort of um, maybe an advice question for PhD students who are, who are, who are interested in exploring interpretability. So, 
I think that it might be easy to sort of think about what the end user or people will, I don't know, someone who's going to be using these things that you're, you're, you're working on might, it might be easy to imagine what might be interpretable, what might be useful. Do you have any advice for PhD students who, who sort of want to have that be guided by an actual practitioner or uh, someone who is going to use these, these tools? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I'll give you a really honest answer. Um, I tried this as a PhD student uh, to get an access to actual practitioners. It was incredibly hard. Uh, the domain that I work in was a uh, rescue, um, personal rescue missions. And it was just like sensitive uh, data and I was never, never getting data. Uh, so what I saw useful and perhaps easier for to get that access is to do industry internships uh, and once you like I had many interns this 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 work that I presented most of the them are, were my interns or, or interns that I co-hosted we got great insights from actual product teams there are many product teams who are, who are using TCAV and they tell us what doesn't work like what uh, what they want uh, you know, they tell us we need more actionable insights and here are a list of actionable insights that you can give us. And that guides my research in a great deal. And that's one of the reasons I really like working here. Um, so I would try that route. Um, perhaps if your faculty has better, uh, uh, like less sensitive domain that you have access to experts, that would be good. But even then, like uh, experts might be expensive. Um, yeah, that would be my, my go-to. Um, I have a question from the anonymous attendee. Um, why is it that the saliency methods still seem to highlight the burden when the network was random? Does this reflect something about the natural biases of CNNs that is sensitive to changes in networks? Yeah, so it might. Um, what it what I think it might be doing, um, so there's, a, there's a, a number of work, by the way, around the same time that showed similar things, like the deep image prior work uh, that came out roughly the same year showed that if you just don't train a network and it in the CNN, pipe in the images, collect activations, it turns out that activation alone is already really good feature extractor, that you can classify a lot of things using that randomly, basically randomly projected vectors. Um, I think that might be something that's that might be going on here too, where uh, it's showing you, it might be showing you some features that might have been used to the classifier, but the 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 argument here is that then that shouldn't be evidence of prediction. It's not about prediction; it's about the data. Uh, and in fact, this may be sidestepping a little bit. Like if, if the information bottleneck paper that came out last year, it was or two years ago, also talks about this notion of the closer the closer to the input layer you are, the more information about the image that you have or the input data you have, and it slowly gets forgotten as you get closer to the prediction layer. It actually can completely forgotten, and you can measure this with the mutual information. And I think this all says that you know there's some information about input there's some future extraction going on. And then uh, finally the prediction happens, but propag propagating this all the way back to input image is a really challenging task. Thank you. Um, just remind people that if you do want to ask the question yourself, please raise your hand. Uh, it should be down at the bottom of your interface. Uh, I'm going to read out a question from Lud. Um, it seems that ACES segmentation may rely on translation and variance. For example, wheels concept doesn't care where the wheels are, but we may not be able to articulate a hand above head concept, or am I seeing this wrong? Hmm, interesting. Yeah, except I guess if you have, uh, actually this, uh, well, there's a, well, maybe. So there, there's a class that we learned that showed a, uh, let me see if I can actually quickly share this because it's, it's it, I find this fun. So when, uh, yeah, this thing. So can you see my screen? 
Okay, so in, in this um, Jinrikisha, it's, it's like a human cart. Uh, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Always shows human who is in the cart as a, as a concept. And I find that stunning because, in, but either way, you're, to answer your question, uh, in this concept, it actually gets the head above the body all the time because that's just what it sees in the, in the natural images. Uh, and in that case, I think that bakes into the, the, the segments. In fact, the reason that we are doing multi-segmentation so we don't just use one gra granularity of this like police van, we use it multiple uh, different sizes of image patches because the bigger patches tends to get that spatial dependency, whereas the smaller patches tries to get that granular like fine grain thing. Um, so I think it could be baked. If it's something that's really important for the model, then the bigger patch where head is above the hands will come up uh, or more higher important with higher TCAP score than not. But of course, that's theory. Cool, thank you. Um, another question from Alessandra Tossi. Um, she says, thanks for the very interesting presentation and great examples. Uh, thinking of the general picture, which do you think are the biggest challenges for post-training interpretability? Which are the most challenging ML tasks and application domains beyond neural networks and image recognition? Oh, was, oh, I thought I was going to get a, a choices, but uh, so the first question was, which are the challenging aspects of post-training interpretability methods? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, Cynthia Rudin, uh, who was my committee member and uh, who I very, very respect, wrote this paper about how we shouldn't use post-training explanation methods. Uh, and I, I we, we talked about this uh, with our in-person too. I think the, one of the challenges is uh, that there could be a discrepancy between, well, there might be something you can't explain in, in, because we are limited as a human, limited to concepts that we know, limited to computational power we have. Uh, there might be concepts or things, networks that we just simply can't explain. The problem is that that will remain unknown unknown. We wouldn't know whether we can't explain or not. We will try our tools to explain it. That might be simply just misleading. Uh, so the question about faithfulness is always comes up in post training. However, my argument is that you know, if you have a choice between not using post training explanation at all versus because you have to just build a model from scratch to inherently interpretable. Um, I would use something as opposed to using nothing, right? It's, it's better than nothing. And there are lots of models, especially big companies like Google, models that I simply can't change because it's decades of hundreds of engineers effort went in there. And um, so one Googler is simply not going to change it, at least in a short time. Um, so, that, that, so that's the first answer to your first question. The, the second question was, what was the second question? Machine learning tasks. The second question was, which are the most challenging ML tasks and application domains, uh, application domains beyond neural networks and image recognition? Oh, I see. Oh, plenty of others. Uh, plenty of other things that has significant serious consequences that uh, we perhaps are uh, shy from trying. Uh, you know, the uh, softwares that judges use uh, to actually change someone's lives. Uh, those are less, perhaps less explored. Uh, there's not a lot of data. We have a lot of data of images, millions, billions, but we don't have a lot of data on that. The medical data, it's sensitive. Um, there might be, at least in US, the, the electric health record is in one format. So there's a lot of noise in the data, missing data. Billing code isn't a good representation of what data is. As a lot of you probably know, that's very, very messy. Um, UK's got that a little better together, but uh, it, here it's very messy. Really important questions to fuse those data together, images, uh, doctor's notes, uh, discrete data, time series data, uh, so many important problems to work on. I don't even know where to begin. Cool. Well, along that line that, that we have a sort of an application, um, uh, an application question here that could be Interesting. So, any interesting example of sound? What do CADs or your research into? Well, yeah, what does that look like when applied to like audio data or something like that? Oh, very interesting question. We did try um, on audio data. It is 
it is uh, it is very interesting and it 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 uh, it works. It's it's very quite stunning. I don't think I I don't I don't actually I should confirm if I can speak about details on that, but um, it, it, it different modalities did work. Uh, another interesting application that we tried that I find it really fun is art. Uh, so uh, we uh, what we did is um, we asked artists or uh, specifically photographers to collect their notion of calm pictures or peaceful pictures or as vague as my father. Um, and we were able to use for really simple Google Net or mobile net, which is pretty simple and now a couple of years old, even using those simple neural network, we were able to capture that notion of my father, very subjective, uh, but somehow it worked a lot better than I could ever imagine. Uh, so that was really fascinating to me. Um, also, other the medical examples and, and people who who just use this methods uh, that I've I've never talked to, uh, lots of them used in all sorts of medical explanations. Like I talked about breast cancer, radiology, but there's a lot more like the health record. I think I saw some, uh, yeah, just like pathology. Those are really particularly exciting to me because. Those are the crowd that exactly that I wanted to get to by using this method so that the folks who doesn't know computer science can start interpreting and using this uh, powerful tool called machine learning. It's really interesting. I really like that example of art. I mean, it's something I've always wondered about, like what are sort of the, the tools for lack of a better term behind, let's say composition or narrative and things like this, how does yeah, what are the elements beyond the words that are used in a story or the brush strokes on a painting that are that are actually conveying some emotional response from us or, or something along those lines? Yeah, totally. Yeah, art is something that I've, I've, I've loved to explore more. It's just a lot of fun, like drawing, hand drawing and art. Can we learn concepts from classical art, like compare Van Gogh with somebody and we might find something surprising. Who knows? Yeah, that's cool. Um, maybe we'll take one last question from Sid. Sid has a few questions. Um, uh, let's do the first one that he had. To what extent are CADs extendable to concepts that capture characteristics beyond, say, surface level features? Could this be applied to something like, say, physical stability of structure? Oh, super interesting. This reminds me of that work by Josh Tenenbaum, and I think, may, uh, oh, who was the first author? So it was a, what's called intuitive physics. Uh, what they did is they took videos, I think it might have been pictures or videos of like structures that build on top of each other, like blocks, and they trained a Bayesian network to predict whether this is gonna, if I hit the table, will it will it uh, uh, um, collapse or will it not? And the answer, if I remember correctly, was yes, you can you can actually predict this. So based on that expert that work, which is a couple of years ago, I think you probably can. Uh, something about stable structure, I think maybe it's a form of like triangle as opposed to upside down triangle-ness uh, would be extracted to do that. Um, other surface level, but I think there's definitely limitation about of um, visualness of these concepts. If you, or, or in language, something had to be distinguishable, something had to be there, like something a lot more abstract, like love, I, I talked about as an example, I don't know how Cav would capture that. That's, that's very interesting. Thank you so much. I think we're going to have to end it there and move on to our to our next meeting. But uh, on behalf of everyone who attended today, thank you so much for the talk. Right. Thanks for having me. This has been great.
Oh.